Okay, I think uh, I'll get started. Welcome to the Gender-Based Violence Within Newcomer Populations. Uh, my name is Mona Hassania, and I am the uh, speaker presenter today, but hopefully this will be a very interactive session um, where we can kind of chat and, and exchange some experiences and, and uh, talk on, on this topic. Before I begin, I would like to um, absolutely make a land acknowledgement, uh, gratefully acknowledging and honoring that the land on which I am gathered and, and presenting on today um, is here in the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, uh, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sabertooth nations. Uh, as a trauma counselor, it's important to understand the intergenerational uh, traumas that uh, exist and what that means in my own work and, and being an ally. Uh, so I do do this in a, in a meaningful way to myself uh, in recognizing this. So you said, my name is Mona Hassania. I am a registered clinical counselor and I am, uh, I've been working in the nonprofit sector and specifically in the settlement sector uh, for over 15 years. Uh, so a lot of really kind of hands-on experience, frontline work, uh, managerial work with uh, newcomer populations, both immigrants, refugees, refugee claimants, government assisted uh, refugees. It's really a, a wide range of populations, which I've had the privilege to, to work with um, before kind of going into the mental health realm uh, of things. I think before just starting to talk about gender-based violence, and I'm sure a lot of you have probably um, been in some of the great discussions earlier today, um, but just the need to kind of highlight why the focus um, tends to be women-centered. And, you know, hopefully you've you've heard this already, um, but this idea that, you know, when we are talking about um, uh, women or women identifying focus, there's several reasons. One is that the prevalence in regards to um, gender-based violence does have happen to women. And so um, just by the sheer statistics of it and, and the numbers out there, you know, we, we do know that um, oftentimes the survivors of gender-based violence are women. Um, and this has a lot to do with patriarchy, which we'll talk about in terms of um, with, with newcomers new, or newcomer populations, but in general within uh, the, the work that we talk about with gender-based violence. So looking at power imbalances and patriarchy. And there's a historical uh, context to it as well, of course. Um, noting that in, in a lot of um, societies, women have been marginalized and oppressed. Um, and so leading to gender inequalities, which have led to um, this norm of power and control. Um, and so, you know, it's important to note that women are disproportionately affected by gender-based violence, um, but then also men and individuals of all genders can also be victims of gender-based violence. So really kind of understanding that um, abuse happens to men as well, and we don't want to discount or minimize that by any means. Um, however, it is important to recognize um, that the most serious or harmful forms of violence do typically uh, happen and are perpetuated by men against um, women, including transgendered women and anyone who self-identifies as a woman. Now, I know you've come here and we're, we're going to focus on um, gender-based violence in the context of uh, newcomer populations. Um, but it is important to know that it is a global issue. The pervasiveness of gender-based violence exists globally. And so you'll notice that you know, one in three uh, women are physically or sexually assaulted. Um, and if we count different forms of abuse, you know, that rate, it was much higher. Um, the second statistics highlights how gender-based violence starts early and kind of shapes the life trajectory of many women and girls. And unfortunately, what we knew already and, and what we have experienced during any time of crisis, um, violence against women increases, as it did with um, within the pandemic, uh, especially during the, the lockdowns. And so 
understanding that you know risks of gender-based violence can really increase during times of crisis. We can't talk about gender-based violence without talking about intersectionality. And what that means is that um, when we're talking about and recognizing how different forms of social inequalities and discriminations intersect and interact with each other. And so creating unique experiences for individuals who belong to different groups or marginalized groups or oppressed groups um, and how that experience shifts in different ways for each person, right? And so um, they're shaped by intersecting identities that can focus on race, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, disability, sexual orientation. All of these really compound experiences to, to demonstrate different um, understandings of how things happen for them and how they are experienced by them. And so we can look at kind of unique vulnerabilities, right? Intersecting identities can create really vulnerabilities that um, may not exist for certain groups, right? So for instance, women from marginalized communities, uh, such as indigenous women, women of color, immigrant and refugee women, and transgender women may face higher rates of violence um, due to the overlapping forms of discrimination and systematic disadvantages that they face. And so being able to kind of understand that, being able to understand that certain access to resources and supports may not be um, equitably available um, across the board and how systematic oppressions, um, looking at systems that are not uh, completely just or have power imbalances affect um, the ability to, to be able to um, perpetuate violence or contribute to so certain social inequalities that may exist. The root causes of, of gender-based violence exist in regards to what we call very much in, in um, what happens when there's patriarchy um, norms. And that means there's a power imbalance. Anything, any gender-based violent form comes from this presumptive area of power and control. So meaning that, you know, it's it's very much related to power imbalances between men and women. And, and social systems where men hold primary powers, um, there's more perpetuation of gender-based violence. And so things such as discrimination and inequality, um, thriving in these areas where inequality exists, where discrimination um, exist. These are factors um, that create unequal access to education, employment, healthcare, resources, and kind of create this environment where women are more vulnerable to violence and to abuse. Socioeconomic factors where poverty can increase the risk of gender-based violence, financial dependence on an abusive partner, or very much limited uh, abilities to have one's own income. Social stigma and victim blaming. Societal attitudes kind of blame victims and stigmatize survivors that discourage reporting and seeking help. Uh, this can again perpetuate this cycle of violence and silence. And unfortunately, weak legal frameworks, um, which you know exist in many parts of the world. Um, these are inadequate legal frameworks where ineffective law enforcement um, and the lack of, you know, uh, being able to, to contribute to persistence of um, the abuser kind of being at, at fault and, and taking on a certain role in terms of perpetuating the gender-based violence against uh, his partner or spouse or any woman. Um, so when there's no consequence or very little consequence in their actions, um, it does send a message that violence is somehow acceptable. And I know that we are talking about um, new gender-based violence in newcomer populations, but I think what is important for me to make sure that I highlight is that gender-based violence occurs, as we've seen throughout the day in all societies. And that it's important to understand that there is a very, very clear link with whenever in any society which in all societies it exists, gender inequalities is linked to increased violence against women. 
So the ability to see a society and inadequacies or inequalities that exist between the genders, there's a proportionality in terms of the increased rate against women against violence. I'd like to open it up and just ask um, from your experience or what, what you possibly um, have kind of encountered or you know, um, know, in what way does settlement impact gender-based violence? Now, please feel free to write it in the chat or feel free to put your hand up. In what way does settlement impact gender-based violence? Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, um, Jessica, saying I feel like you wouldn't know resources, not as connected to the community or in new places that you don't know. Absolutely, so it heightens definitely. Yeah, the not being familiar with the resources or availability of of resources definitely heightens um, and perpetuates. Yeah. It's easier to become more isolated, for sure. Any other ways of how settlement might impact gender-based violence? If you're thinking about kind of a situation where uh, a, a new family potentially arrives um, and perhaps there has been pre-existing abuse, how does that impact? How does that impact coming into a new country with a new set of rules and a new way of life? Melissa saying poverty, culture shock, fear of isolation. Absolutely. Yeah. That is very true. Yes, Jessica, absolutely. You may be very dependent on your abuser, right? And um, what we've seen over and over again um, is that when there's a um, pre existing when there's pre-existing um, violence and abuse that happens within the family um, and they come to a new host country, so for example, they move to Canada, there's typically a, a kind of pause in that abuse and then it heightens. And one of the reasons for that is, is as you've all mentioned, right, um, that it's, it's much more likely for the people to become more isolated, for the stressors to increase, um, and for more violence and abuse to be perpetuated, especially for um, a situation where the woman uh, is may be quite dependent on her abuser um, and has language barriers and not able to access um, supports in the way that she she would or could. And so as many of you were, were correct um, in saying, uh, social isolation is a big one. And so there's often not enough community-based resources for immigrant and refugee women in general, um, particularly for, um, for, for those enduring violence. And so immigrant and refugee um, women are often not provided with information about these resources earlier on. Um, and there's a hesitation in terms of utilizing some of these supports. Uh, now, for, especially for women of precarious um, immigration statuses, there's a real fear of deportation. And so, you know, unfortunately, abusive partners may use the immigration and refugee process um, itself to be able to exert power and control uh, over their, their partners. And so what happens is that, you know, um, women who may be sponsored by an abusive partner um, are told incorrect and false information about their ability to stay in Canada, depending on, you know, what that is. And if you don't, if you remember not too long ago, 
um, Canada had unfortunately uh, changed its laws to say that, you know, anybody who was under sponsorship and was brought in would be under a t temporary sponsorship. And the goal for that was to make sure that these relationships were valid, right? That they weren't fake marriages for the for for um, getting permanent residency in Canada. But what they hadn't factored in with that law was the amount of um, abuse and violence that and power and coercion that um, resulted with that, right? So that you know that two-year temporary um, permanent residency really rested on whether or not the person was typically um, the male, uh, you know, had power to to bring uh, or send back the partner. Um, unfortunately, because of so much um, active uh, work on um, uh, by by people who work in the the gender based violence. Um, they were able to kind of change that that law. So I see just saying, oh yes, of course, if you leave that the fear that you may be in may be deported when you're trying to find safety, but fear you'll be in put in a worse situation, at least perhaps by their thinking. Absolutely. That kind of notion of the lesser uh, evil. Okay. Unfortunately, the fear of police is also another dominant reason. Um, in terms of perhaps why people don't come up um, and move forward with, with um, addressing gender-based violence. And this could be related to their own experiences back home with the police, or it could be their experiences here. Uh, a lot of uh, individuals kind of, their first interaction might be with a CBSA officer, right? Um, and those are typically more interrogative and questionable in terms of you know their, their existence. And so, um, you know, there, there really is that, that kind of uh, fear based of being able to take this um, forward. Financial and economic exclusion. A lot of times foreign credentials are not easily recognized in Canada. And many of the immigrant and refugee women um, really experience what we call this de-skilling upon arrival. And so they're often overrepresented um, and the lowest paying in kind of the least stable jobs. And so they don't have necessarily the, the financial uh, basis for self-supporting themselves. Language barriers, as uh, Melissa, you, you mentioned, absolutely. So not being to, able to access information and services in the language that they speak. Um, and we know sometimes, uh, you know, interpreters are not always uh, available. Racism and xenophobia. So immigrant and refugee women face a lot of um, uh, discrimination at times for stereotypes and services um, that are, are stereotyped in terms of harmful uh, remarks or discriminations against a person's um, perhaps culture or religion um, in regards to, you know, being possibly blamed for the violence that they survived. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes shelter services lack some policies and practices to be able to really accommodate and celebrate diversities. Fear of stigma from significant others, example, family, absolutely. And we'll talk a bit more about some of the uh, issues that kind of stop people from being able to kind of move forward with, with being able to seek help and address it. And I think you're, you're absolutely on the right, right page in terms of the stigma, the family stigma um, in, in regards to culture and, and those dynamics. Now, with this all said, I, I, I do also want to look at it from, from a bit of a resilience base, right? Immigrant women are, are quite resilient, um, and they do support each other um, in a very uh, informal way of being able to kind of outside these social structures, be able to exchange information, be able to adv advise one another, um, and kind of uh, share and engage in that way. They often have different multiple uh, language skills, um, and they develop creative ways to be able to build a, a community and trying to figure out different ways of becoming a, a economically independent um, and kind of be able to heal from some of those experiences of violence. Um, and a lot of times they're actually leaders in the anti-gender uh, based violence movement across many provinces in Canada. So it is important to also note um, some of that resilience piece. Now, there are many forms of gender-based violence, as I'm sure we've talked about all throughout some of the sessions today. Um, 
are they equally perceived as gender-based violence across cultures and societies? So when we talk about um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, emotional, psychological abuse, financial abuse, across some of these, are they equally perceived across different cultures and societies? What are your thoughts? So Jessica say no, okay. Any thoughts in terms of why that might be? So for example, um, somebody comes, uh, a newcomer comes to you and says, you know, um, my husband is withholding uh, credit cards and uh, you know there's no allowance that's given to me I have no access to finances um, and perhaps the worker you know explains that this this may be a form of financial abuse do you think that the person's reaction may be um, equally kind of understandable that 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 is a form of abuse I see some people writing yeah Nope, okay. Preconceived bias or gender roles that perpetuate? Absolutely, yeah. No, I don't think so. Many cultural practices devalue women and LGBTQ+, absolutely. Patriarchal ideology, definitely. And I think that this is a, it's a good place for us to be able to have these discussions because I think that what constitutes as abuse um, here in Canada may not be the same in other cultures or societies. And so when we kind of talk about, let's say this idea of, and I'm taking the financial um, abuse as a as an example, in that maybe back home, you know, this this was really how it was done and, and there was no issue around it, right? And so it was a it was a patriarchy norm and that was accepted by the society. Um, and so there isn't that viewpoint of that, right? We, I work a lot with survivors and, you know, even when we talk about the, the physical forms um, of, of abuse, you know, there is a huge difference in regards to somebody seeing a slap on the face as a, a form of abuse versus pitting and punching and, and, um, and, and so on. And so being able to have and, and creating, and we'll talk more about this, this, the opportunity to kind of exchange these ideas and talk about, you know, what, what constitutes as abuse, um, specifically here, uh, is, is an important discussion uh, to have. I mean, say MJ is saying, in some cultures, beating by husband is seen as a sign of love. Absolutely. And I'm so great that you, it's so great that you brought up that example. Um, it's one that we come across a lot by, by women sometimes saying, like, you know, if, if my husband doesn't, beat me, then that means he doesn't care about what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. And so again, a patriarchal ideology in terms of power and control, right? And how to how that is interpreted into, into signs of love. So some, some don't believe emotional abuse is abuse because maybe there's no physical abuse and the abuser feels they are allowed to, or they have the power right to act that way. Absolutely. Emotional abuse is, is a very difficult one um, for people to uh, kind of come across and understanding that uh, it is it is an act of abuse and it is a it is considered gender based violence. Right. Yeah. I never hit her. So it's fine. Absolutely. That excuse of, you know, I, I don't hit her. So I'm not abusive. Right. And again, very quite dominant. Again, the more patriarchal society, the more that these norms are accepted, okay? And this is the, the tricky part because when we talk about gender-based violence and we start kind of looking at, you know, what does that mean in terms of the complexities of being able to blame uh, culture in sexual gender-based violence or gender-based violence? And so violence against women, it's not my culture, was a very um, popular campaign that was done in Canada. 
uh, noting that you know the dominant culture in virtually all societies is very much patriarchy and what happens is that patriarchy says that you know men are better than women and so patriarchy really validates and uh, gender-based violence okay but what we have to understand that is that no culture is ever static right and no society has a singular culture each and every person is really entitled to human rights and so the understanding and the the dynamic of kind of being able to say um oh this is this is connected to their culture or this is their belief system or this is their political views right it is universal and under international law that all states regardless of their political economic and cultural systems have the obligation to promote and protect all human beings and their fundamental freedoms for all. And so I think this kind of notes a, a bit more in terms of, you know, our impacts of, of bias. And bias is a very natural inclination um, for or against an idea, right? Um, it's often learned and is highly dependable on variables like a person's socioeconomic status, their race, their ethnicity, their educational background, and we all have it. Um, it plays a significant role in how it can influence the way uh, that we assess and provide support to survivors of gender-based violence. Because unconscious bias based on factors such as race, ethnicity, culture, socioeconomic status may all really impact us in terms of our understanding the survivor's experience and kind of this need to recognize and address these biases is really crucial in ensuring that survivors receive really appropriate and equitable supports. And so we really have to be mindful about how these biases may arise from our own cultural background and our own assumptions. Okay? And this is why we call for self-reflection to be able to kind of identify and challenge some of these uh, biases, making it... Um, more allowable for cultural sensitivity uh, and appropriate interventions to take place. Let's see some notes. Okay. Thank you, Tofiki, sorry. And so I think that, you know, when we think about how biases can intersect also with other forms of discrimination, such as racism, uh, ableism, uh, homophobia, uh, further marginalizing different survivors. And so as um, workers or settlement practitioners or people serving um, uh, such populations, we really must be able to be, uh, be aware of these multiple identities uh, and experiences of survivors to be able to really break through some of these biases that we ourselves might be able to hold. There's a really cam a great campaign. And so part of this work in terms of kind of um, being able to create awareness, being able to create some preventative measures um, to be able to help uh, survivors within especially immigrant and refugee populations is a campaign um, by the settlement sector that was created by the Neighborhood Friends and Families, the NFF, um, to really raise identifying uh, gender-based violence. And so these are card decks and they're actually, if you are able to go on their site, they're able to provide that at no charge um, to any uh, organization, settlement organization. Um, and so the front of each card is kind of this question asking you, you know, which would you choose? And it shows two very different situations, one that's quite abusive and one that's, that's quite healthy. So each card um, in the set illustrates kind of a different form of abuse physical, sexual, emotional, verbal, financial, psychological, um, as well as stalking. Uh, and so when you open the card, there's more information on the specific form of abuse that's shown on the card as well and kind of warning signs of abuse and what to look out for. And on the back of the card, there are some resources um, available. And so what I love about this card deck is that it just creates a bit more awareness in terms of what abuse actually looks like. And so within the, the context of this uh, cultural uh, aspect and also this ability to, to be able to have some conversations 
uh, around those pieces. So I encourage you if, if you know, that's something that interests you um, to, to look for that. There's a lot of barriers that stop um, uh, women from reporting or disclosing uh, any kind of abuse. Uh, and so some of, you know, there's, there's a lot of multiple and intersecting barriers for that. Um, and these barriers are encountered by non-immigrant women uh, as well. Um, but some of them are, are related to their uh, immigration context. And so fear um, of losing their children, right? The apprehension um, of, of being able to um, have their kids, the, the apprehension of having their kids being taken away from them. Uh, this is something that's, you know, come up so many times. And it's really important that in any kind of safety planning to make sure to include the children um, as early on as possible. The feelings of shame and guilt, so feel, feelings of being uh, blamed or making the situation even worse. Uh, values that conflict with our, our family or our culture. Uh, many times collectivist cultures believe that, you know, keeping the family together is actually more important or more primary um, uh, than, than doing anything that kind of breaks the, uh, the, the family uh, apart, including seeing it as a quote unquote private matter. Social and cultural isolation. A lot of you have met, kind of discussed that, right? Social stigmas related to even disclosing uh, abuse, right? Limited knowledge about uh, laws and rights and domestic services. Um, discrimination and racism within service delivery systems, uh, distrust of systems, uh, not knowing who, who to be able to talk to, um, fear of, of deportation due to precarious immigration status, and lack of coordinated services or accessible shelters. We know that on any given night in Canada, 300 women are turned away from shelters because there, there's no space for them. And so, you know, accessibility um, is a real need, uh, including, you know, do they have adequate provisions for the kind of spiritual, cultural, religious uh, needs or physical barriers that, that some folks may, may have or experience? Any thoughts, comments on this? Anything that comes up for, for anyone? Do you think the role of frontline staff or anyone serving um, the population of um, immigrant and refugee women, specifically those uh, survivors, is to really create awareness and education? Um, and this means to be able to, first and foremost, educate ourselves, right, on some of the, the key aspects to look at, some of the educational pieces that we can kind of take on. A lot of you are here for, for kind of gaining some information and sharing some, some information in regards to that, which is fantastic. Um, but also to be able to create some norms in terms of um, prevention. What typically I think um, we can work towards is really kind of perpetuating this idea of gender equality. So really kind of challenging harmful gender norms. So, you know, if somebody's making a, a joke are we laughing along with it to be polite? Or are we kind of advocating um, more for the rights and empowerment of marginalized individuals? Jessica is saying, um, I worked a summer at a women's shelter and it was heavy, but so eye-opening. So to the crisis that the shelters are facing with the lack of beds, lack of beds specifically for newcomer seniors. Absolutely, like I said, Unfortunately, this, this, this statistic of 300 women being turned away is, um, is from a couple of years ago. And we know that a lot of these services have actually uh, become more and more limited. Um, yeah, and Indigenous as well, absolutely. So ensuring that we're doing our best in terms of preventative measures. Crisis intervention. So being able to provide immediate supports to somebody who is experiencing gender-based violence. So offering a safe, confidential environment where survivors are able to share their experience, provide emotional support and validations, um, and just to be able to kind of assist with them in terms of their safety planning. Cultural sensitivity is also key, meaning that some practitioners or frontline workers can really position, are well positioned to 
understand the unique challenges that are faced by immigrant and refugee communities when addressing sexual or gender-based violence. They're able to take into account things like culture, um, linguistics, uh, religion, um, and they're able to better ensure that survivors receive or advocate for them to receive culturally competent care. And collaboration advocacy, and I think advocacy is one of the main things that we can really do is um, to be able to, you know, connect and, and discuss with various stakeholders, such as government agencies, law enforcement, healthcare providers, uh, community organizations, just to be able to um, advocate for, for our client, but also perhaps some policy changes and increased resources that are so much needed. Melissa is saying, I live downtown Edmonton and the homeless population of women, youth and children is heartbreaking. Absolutely. And I can say, unfortunately, Melissa, it's not very different here either um, where I'm sitting in Vancouver. Um, there, you know, I think we, we absolutely have a, a housing crisis for sure, uh, especially in our province. Uh, it sounds like in yours as well. Um, but that a lot of this really kind of impacts, um, again, the, the uh, seeking to get out of such abusive relationship, especially for um, refugee and immigrant women. Jessica saying, my husband and I cleaned some of the old camp ups in the River Valley in Edmonton. We found diaper boxes, kids clothes, toys. We both just wanted to cry, wondering where this family was. Oh my gosh, yeah. No. This is a, a wonderful tool and it's called the Blue Sky. So it's the acronym Blue Sky. And what essentially it means is, um, is to using it in terms of supporting um, newcomer women who are living with, with um, a, an abuser in an abusive situation. First and foremost, believe her. Uh, being able to come out and, and talk about it is not an easy thing to say. So we're not there to, to play detectives, right? We're there to be able to believe the person. We're able to listen. A lot of times that is really kind of the start of this process of, of being able to kind of share their thoughts and where they're at. Be able to understand her immigration status, what that looks like, what that means. Um, ease her isolation, providing supports, providing uh, things that you know are, are accessible to her and for her. Support her choices, and that's a big one. You know, there's a lot of times that we just really wish we could um, push the person into leaving her abusive partner, right? But that's not our job. And our job is really to support the person, meet them where they're at, and kind of allow them to, to um, be the ones at the center of their own decisions and, and choices. Know about resources that, so that you can share those resources, um, whether the person chooses to take them or not. And also understand that your voice really matters. A lot of this means that um, your ability to validate her, your ability to say that this is not okay, um, really does matter uh, because most of the time she's hearing the quite the opposite. Um, and so really be uh, aware of the words that you choose and what you're saying uh, in, in regards to that. I was going to say, frontline workers do so much, and it's such heavy work. I applaud their work and hearts. Absolutely. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I can I can do that for sure at the end, Michelle, uh, sharing some of the resources. Definitely. Thank you. So this is a really great tool. Um, as is, is the very simplistic, uh, the three R's approach. Right. And so this ability, you know, I think that when it comes to any situation with gender based violence, but specifically so with for newcomers, you know, there is almost a hesitation of I don't want to make things worse. And how do I deal with this? And and so on and so forth, especially if there haven't been um, much training involved in that. And so when we're talking about the three R's, we're looking at recognize, respond and refer. And so first and foremost, the ability to recognize the warning signs and behaviors of abuse, right? It, are we in a place where we are able to say, you know, can we check in with you alone, right? The ability to kind of make sure that it's in a safe environment, 
be able to check in to just ask, you know, how things are going, open-ended questions and say, hey, I've noticed some, some things and I just want to check in with you and make sure that things are going okay. Um, and that if there is a response to that um, in regards to um, sharing with you that yes, perhaps abuse is taking place, then making sure that it's you're responding in a very safe and non-judgmental manner that allows for trust and disclosure, right? Um, it, again, really building on this idea of how you respond, the words that you say, the awareness that is associated with that, and the, the trust that is being created with that person. And thirdly, referring to um, appropriate services, right, and support, being able to have that toolkit of places uh, to be able to uh, send the person and be able to provide um, that understanding for them uh, that there are services available and that, you know, you're able to kind of um, help in, in regards to some of those referrals. Ending an abusive relationship is absolutely never easy. Um, it takes about seven times for a woman to pack her bags, to leave the house, um, to finally end the relationship. So seven times, um, statistically, she needs to go through that before. And that doesn't mean that's the same for everyone. So remember, each and every person is, is their own unique um, culture and person and, you know, tends to do things their own way. Um, but it is, it is something quite hard. And unfortunately, a woman's risk of being killed by a legally separated spouse in Canada is six times higher um, than the risk of being married to that person. Okay. Um, so there are risks that are involved. There is a decision um, that comes that is, is quite hard. And leaving is not always the end. Uh, we have seen a lot of threats and pressures that may continue from the abuser. Um, and some women do decide to go back uh, to, to some of the hardships that they face um, uh, alone or for other reasons. And so I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the cycle of abuse. Um, and depending on where that abuse is taking place or where um, that where that person is in the cycle, they may have different ideas, right? Um, oftentimes after a very kind of escalated, heated, um, abusive situation, there's what we call the honeymoon phase, right? Where the, the person is, is quite subdued, the abuser is quite subdued and, and uh, apologetic and um, makes really grand gestures to get the the person back and and sometimes that does happen and and there's calm and, and unfortunately the tension builds up again and, and the excuse hap uh, the the abuse happens again and so this is important in understanding um, ending an abusive relationship because you can have somebody to come and say that's it I'm done I'm leaving this person forever because it's right after an abusive um, situation has happened and you know the week after they can come and say, actually, you know what, things are okay. I was just overreacting. I made a mistake. Um, and it could be very well because they're in the honeymoon phase, right? So kind of understanding um, how the cycle of, you, of abuse uh, also impacts uh, leaving leaving the, the partner. Absolutely. It, it really much is a roller coaster. And last but certainly not least, making sure that there's self-care for providers, right? Um, as Jessica was saying, you know, it's, it's really heavy work in terms of doing frontline. Um, and I always go back to this amazing quote. It says, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and lost daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to, to be able to walk through water without getting wet, right? So really being able to take care of yourself and maintain your own wellness. Um, I love the fact that social work has an ethical obligation for self-care for um, social workers, meaning that it is ethically your job to take care of yourself so that you are able to take care of others in the way that so many of you do. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, anything that comes up for anyone. Um, on this topic, I know we only had a very limited time, and I hope I kind of highlighted on on some of the key points of um, gender-based violence and newcomer populations. But again, I'm, I'm happy to answer anything uh, that comes up for anyone. I 
Any thoughts, questions, comments? If you could wave a magic wand, what policies or action would you like taken to address this uh, issue? Great question. Oh, so many things. Um, I think one of the things that we underestimate a lot is our preventative measures. Um, and so by prevention, specifically talking about newcomer populations is about right from the start, um, talking about equality and talking about, you know, um, equal gender norms, right? And being able to really kind of um, instill that in everything that we do as, as frontline workers. Um, that said, you know, I, I would also, the amount of resources is next to none, uh, unfortunately. And, and there's a great demand and, and unfortunately it, it continues to increase. So the ability to um, increase, you know, third stage housing, increase, uh, shelters, increase uh, just access to, to therapy and to wellness programs for women. Um, it really takes a toll um, on a survivor in terms of, you know, the uh, uh, many, many women that I work with, is, you know, they say the physical scars heal. It's the psychological ones um, that continue for many years. Um, and so the ability to really kind of um have and create policies where where we're taking care of of vulnerable populations uh, question is what are your thoughts on the effectiveness of current measure to protect women from being contacted or pursued by abusers like restraining orders i don't feel they are effective honestly unfortunately i would say that they're not and this comes from a lot of experience in working with survivors. Um, majority of the time, you know, unfortunately, that piece of paper doesn't mean much. And again, from my own experience working with, with survivors, um, there isn't really a big enforcement um, by law offices. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, we see some of those pieces in the news, right, when it's, when it's really too late. Um, but they're they're not they're not effective. Um, I I would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also go back to this also the other idea of, um, you know, stalking is a really big one that that um, our discussions with newcomers go around. Right. This idea of stalking is 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 a hard one to grasp culturally sometimes saying that, you know, well, what does that mean? Like, yeah, my husband shows up all the time at my workplace, checks in on me, you know, is that a healthy thing? Is that not? And so having just these discussions and, and kind of addressing of what, what that looks like um, in, in the context of, of abuse and defining. That's the thing. It was fabulous. Thank you. My question is, as North American women, how do we navigate our notions of normality but continue to honor cultural differences and complexities and challenges of newcomers without bias? How do we stop our biases from influencing our actions in helping survivors and newcomers? I love that question. Thank you so much, Melissa. And I think it's a really important one. And I think that's where, you know, I go back to this idea of prevention also means being able to open up these conversations and normalizing the conversation in and of itself, right? Um, and that's what I do with a lot of my um, uh, colleagues as well is the ability to say, you know, really kind of transparently to say like, in, in th this is what happens in this society, right? What happens, you know, back home? What is your your cultural understanding of it and then being able to kind of have these open discussions um with it and i know that there's a lot of bias and um kind of misjudgment around um you know we we talk a lot with um women wearing hijabs right it's almost like it's a very hot button question to say to talk about abuse in in regards to that we're not talking about the religion we're talking about the specific person and what what's going on for them right 
and to, to be able to have these open conversations so that we are providing service, so that there's equity in terms of um, being able to provide help and, and uh, things that are, are very much needed, um, I would say is that open conversation, the, the normalizing of having these conversations, right? We're not taking a stand. We're not saying this is how it should be and this is what you should be doing, right? It's a very much a person-centered approach. Um, but the ability to have these conversations and you'll be surprised at the length in terms of some of the things that come out when it's just the conversation, when it's just kind of that transparency. Thank you, Melissa. A oh, great, great question. I don't know if I have a question, but it was more just a reflection because there was so much brought up and I, I love that Melissa touched on like the biases because I know even for myself, sometimes I'm like, can I like, yeah, how does that influence my actions or my willingness even to step in if I'm seeing something or I'm, I'm suspecting something's happening? Um, and I love the graphic. Like, I've never seen that graphic before, but I love the blue sky graphic because you were talking about that. And even before, like recognizing the signs and I was like, oh, crap. Like I had a few alarm bells go off because I, I do have a loved one that may or may not be in that kind of right. scenario that maybe it's not physical, but and even just hearing, I was like, mm, I have to think about that a bit more. So there's, there's even things that I'm taking away that maybe just will help me recognize. Maybe that's just not a healthy relationship. Yeah. Um, and maybe just like, yeah, coach. And, and I, I've definitely supported people in my life, but mm -hmm. I love that you help us recognize too, just to, that maybe something that we think is, I guess that's normal, maybe not be normal. Uh, and we need to just look at that closer. Um, but one thing, and, and actually that it came up too, is like, you're talking a lot about like, yeah, the, the policy change and, and supporting. And I think that's absolutely critical, but I've, I was going to bring up that I've actually seen a, a, another kind of program and that focuses on the men, um, that actually yeah. is like telling them that this isn't healthy and also like how to have healthy habits, what isn't healthy behavior, how to handle your emotions and talk about your mental health. Because I think that's also in cultures is like, the problems that maybe are like exasperating this abuse is like because they don't know how to emotionally handle themselves they don't understand that that's not okay um so i've seen actually and it actually came out of a story here in edmonton where um this was quite a while ago but um it was a woman who was uh murdered by her ex-boyfriend and the boyfriend at the time has actually been a huge advocate for men's health ever since and saying like we need to stop this thinking that it's okay to think this way mm -hmm. um so he's actually started a men's program here in edmonton and i'm just wondering like how how do you feel about that like actually trying to go to the patriarchy and say like you need to change oh. rather than like just support the, the the victims like you need to change and like yeah building these programs to help men too absolutely absolutely and what i do want to make clear is that you know when we talk about patriarchy um you know there are many many men who are working very hard against patriarchy, right? And there are many women who are perpetuating patriarchy, right? And so it's not kind of this man against woman situation, right? It's it's this bigger ideology. And so understanding, absolutely being able to have these conversations. My biggest um, note on that would be, it's not about what you're saying, it's how you're saying it and how you're framing. It. And I'll give you a really good example of that. You know, we uh, it's many years ago, we tried to run a men's group. Um, nobody showed up, <laughs> right? And, and we, we tried to create a, a circle time. You know, the, the women's group was working perfectly. We took that model. We tried to implement it for the men. Nobody showed up. And we thought, okay, how can we kind of um, figure this out? And how can we kind of utilize cultural competency in creating another different atmosphere? And so what we did was we went to a barber shop. We created like, hey, here's a group where you chat, you have coffee, and you can get your hair cut. And there's a facilitator that talks about these things in terms of wellness and stress relief. And, and so the content stayed the same. It was just in a different environment with a different context. And it attracted, we had a wait list, right? And so it's a really good example in terms of you know, just approach and how to be able to open up and engage these conversations. It's not so much the, the actual content, but rather the, the creation of that safety and that place of like, 
yeah, no, you're not being attacked. So it's okay to open up. It's okay to talk about, um, you know, the trauma that maybe you have and how that perpetuates itself and, and so on and so forth. I think that's such a great thing to say, the context and actually going where there may, may, may be males or male identifying, or again, it, it translates to every group, right? Like you, seniors, actually going to where they are and where they feel comfortable rather than them at being asked to go into a space that they don't know and they don't feel comfortable or they might feel like if they're coming into like a room and sitting in a circle, they're like, what am I, an AA? Like, I don't have a exactly. problem. Exactly. And it's instead us going like, hey, you can be comfortable and in a place you're familiar with and you like going to, and we're just going to have a general conversation. Yeah. And yeah. like, maybe you might get enlightened a bit and maybe you won't. So I'd love to see that kind of model. Um, and I think that's such a great model. Like, that's so good. I'd love to see that model for seniors as well, because we know like senior abuse is also an issue. We know that. And then also youth, because we know like, you know, this is a generational thing, you know, lots of abused or abusers will say, well, my dad hit me, his dad hit him. You know, my mom slapped me. It's yeah. totally fine. I turned out okay. But when you, you have to make that conscious choice with knowledge. Of Absolutely. How Absolutely. you're going to be. And if we can get into those spaces with folks, I feel like it will be good. So I just wanted to just say like, yeah, there's just so much going through my head right now. And I, I love everything you brought up. So thank you. Thank you so much. That's good. And yeah, absolutely. The creating those safe spaces, right? We, we When we talk about safety, you know, we're not talking about like physical safety. We're talking about the ability for people to engage and to be vulnerable and to open up, right? And to be able to have maybe some difficult conversations, which majority of people really, really want that. And so um, it really does help in, in that regard. Yeah. And I do want to plug you. So I couldn't quite make out. I think, I hope I put in your website, right? I just thought I'd put that in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> click on it. I know it's a little small. So I was like, let's just make sure people can see it. But Thank you so much. Thank I wonder you. if anybody else has any last yeah. thoughts. I know we're coming up on your time. So I'll be quiet and see if anybody has anything to say. And if you have something to share or thoughts and ideas, I mean, this is, I think this is such a great space to deal with it, um, to be able to exchange ideas and thoughts and, and so on. So. Okay. I am just wondering about that blue sky. Like, is that quite public information or it was it your and, website? Because I was like, I just want that graphic like put on social media, like even as like a highlighter. Absolutely, thing. right? It's For myself, fantastic. I remember yeah. that acronym um, a little bit more. I'm just like, where did you find that? Or did you make it? Or who out did no, that? No, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's from from the um, NFF. So from, you know, it's based in Ontario. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Michelle. And I don't know how to, how to be able to share that here. Um, I'm happy if anybody wants to email me, I'm happy to send it to them. I, I, I think that's probably the best. Um, so yeah. 